From WBFO and Buffalo, Toronto Public Media, this is Buffalo What's Next, Producer Picks. Highlights of important interviews from our daily program on race, segregation, and the shootings on May 14th. On today's program, Akua Men's I Do on DEI. Well, I would say as a practitioner in this space, um, it's really getting to the point where you're creating environments that are very inclusive, right? We'll also hear from Imam Fajri Ansari, NAACP President Mark Blue with information on how to apply to the 514 Survivors Fund, social worker Veronica Golden, and artist Bianca McGraw on supporting children through trauma and the connective power of Legos. I'm Angelie Preston. Thanks for joining us. We begin this week's program with WBFO's Jay Moran. And very pleased uh, to be uh, with Bianca L. Period McGraw, Buffalo yes. artist. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. We've uh, got the ultimate multitasker here because uh, <laughs> Bianca, as she's going to be talking to me and about her art and about uh, some of the inspirations behind her art, she is actually also painting. Is it? Are you painting or are you drawing? Um, I'm painting. Okay. So I'm painting with coffee. With coffee. Yes. It's uh, fascinating. She's doing it right in front of me. Tell me a little bit about the piece that you're doing in front of me at this moment. Um, right now, I am working on uh, a painting of DJ Syke, um, who is a local uh, DJ for the city of Buffalo. And it is one of the, it's the fifth uh, painting of my series that's dealing with uh, coffee addiction and gun addiction within uh, America. And so I'm just, you know, dealing, doing these uh, pieces since the uh, shooting um, that occurred at the uh, Tops Market. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Mark Talley, our producer just uh, stepped over he was he caught he caught him caught his curiosity he stepped over to make sure he got a, a, a look at uh, some of these pieces mm -hmm. um you mentioned the the top shooting on on may 14th and it's interesting you as a as a art someone who teaches art but is also an artist as well on may 14th um after that for a little bit you mm -hmm. kind of put things on hold for a little bit talk about that yeah, I um, felt like my artistry uh, took a hit because uh, in uh, it made the shooting made me think about what happened at Northern Illinois University, uh, February fourteenth, two thousand eight. Where, we of had, course, you were a student. Yeah, I was a student. Um, I was a a grad student, and uh, there was an on campus shooting where five students um, were uh, killed, and the uh, shooter took their own life. Uh, university responded fast, but it the I don't want to say the may mayhem, but it's just the idea of what happens during um, or an on-campus shooting or an active shooting situation. Uh, it's very overwhelming. And what happens next and the healing that has to occur um, with the community, with yourself, uh, with staff. Uh, so that stayed with me, especially uh, moving out here to Buffalo, like, you know, leaving Chicago and then coming to work at Buffalo um, and then realizing that shootings are so close as they keep happening across the U.S. And it was just like it's happened nine minutes from my house. And it just feels like, you know, you're watching. I feel like it was like an attack on my own community. I'm watching my entire community being constantly attacked, you know, for running, walking, jogging, <laughs> um, being, sleeping, shopping. It just... It's frustrating. Um, it's so frustrating that I felt like a lot of my art is my art is about um, social narratives, identity, culture, justice. But how? What does that mean? And so I just felt I was exhausted. And so, what makes me happy is drinking coffee. And so I decided to start these paintings. Um, well, I started one. Because I was painting with coffee and was like, what happens when you take your coffee addiction with America's uh, addiction to guns? And what, what does that juxtaposition look like? And so that's what these for me are. But also I feel like I'm 
kind of going through a process of healing while I'm doing this. I want to talk a little bit more yeah. about the coffee paintings, but I'm going to jump back in your career just a mm-hmm. little bit here to yeah. a magnificent piece that you did with Lego, mm-hmm. a Black Lives Matter piece. Yes. A very dramatic piece, very large piece. What was the inspiration behind that? George Floyd. Um, George Floyd occurred. Again, I'm questioning what is me as artist is going to do. I had opportunity to work with Art Playground uh, and submit that piece and was able to do that piece in front of the Swan uh, Street Diner. And um, it itself became this massive it's just an image of a Black Lives Matter protester or advocate, if you will. And just just made from Legos. Uh, had opportunity to put it there. Had opportunity to put it at the Tremaine Center, Buffalo Arts uh, Studio, um, and just the idea that it can be an interactive piece. Um, I've seen it's, it's cute watching kids re uh, position the Legos. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, As an artist, you're okay with that. <laughs> I mean, you know, gentrification can happen with art. You know, a little bit. They build the Starbucks. It was cute. Uh, so, <laughs> but. Um, you know, it's just the idea of taking something that's playful but a very serious tone. But it was like, how do you make these statements um, artistically and create and take up space? So a lot of my art is about taking up space, reclaiming space. Um, but the whole project for that project, it, it's actually called the Reclaim and Redistribute Project. And so a lot of the community donated Legos. And what we did was we created uh, these uh, creative creativity packets. And so I work with the, I think it's the uh, Seneca Development Center. And we did a program where we did like a Lego bar and we did poetry with them and play with them and they got to pick their own Legos. And so, and they got these kits that we got a chance to create. So we got money from uh, Art Playground and different organizations that donated and we made these cute uh, Lego kits and also they had art, all these art supplies in it. So it was awesome to be able to give back to the community. I'd like to, you know, the Mm -hmm. one thing is, of course, you know, we are, we're here on radio, so we can't necessarily show everything, but I want to, you know, for, for, I know, Everybody multitasks yeah. for me, but <laughs> uh, but if you want to go are. as you're listening, <laughs> as you're as you're listening, if you want to go to uh, Bianca's uh, Instagram uh, page, go to at Bianca L period at Bianca L period, and you can take a look at all of her um, uh, work that, that uh, she has right here these these coffee paintings, but also that uh, magnificent uh, Lego work of the Black Lives Matter movement. Oh, uh, I'm I'm curious about you know, it's interesting. From an artist standpoint, mm-hmm. clearly, as I talk to you and we're beginning to know each other here, at times you can see how certain things really affect you as an artist. <laughs> Is it a sense that you have to get that out of you, that work through these these issues, these emotions that come to you through your art? I think to each artist is different. Uh, I think for myself, um, I am discovering now that art is healing. Um, Art is piecing me as a person back together, um, but also allowing me to be a part of community action. So though art, um, depending on what I'm doing, like the idea of making events from this, I can do these, but what comes next? Like the Lego piece could have just been just Legos, but there was another step. Um, How do you create the extra step to engage? So doing these paintings, I do these paintings um, at places. Like I don't just do them in my studio or at my house. I actually go to restaurants or events or (laughs) a radio station. (laughs) (laughs) That's new Uh, Yeah, this is new. (laughs) And paint. Um, I feel like painting within the community allows me to be a part of a conversation that will occur because people will walk up and then they will ask you. And I feel like dialogue is what's missing sometimes from narrative. Um, We have narrative, but we don't always get a chance to discuss it. And so creating spaces, um, for me, like taking up space and creating space to have discussion uh, has been something that is both healing, but also maybe healing from the person who's interacting with me because they get to talk about their own experiences and how they're experiencing the art. And when you get to have that one-on-one with people, I just feel like it's it in itself is an exchange that is amazing. So, because I, I know mm-hmm. there are some artists who would say, I leave my art out there to mm-hmm. stand and speak on its own. But you're saying that one of the things you like about mm-hmm. is the getting into a dialogue 
based on the response from your from your work? Yes, I think that exchange is very important because I as artists can learn from it. Um, there, I've done a lot of controversial pieces in the past. I'm going to print those up right now. But, <laughs> but you learn from when people are able to talk to you. I think the biggest thing about artists is that the idea of critique. But what does critique look like when it's just not about, you know, in the educational uh, space or just the gallery space? What about when it's outside spaces where people can interact with art, not necessarily, not necessarily in these traditional spaces, but they get to experience it in other places, but they get to talk to the artists. Not everyone gets that opportunity. Right. And so, yes, there are a lot of times some things speak for themselves, but they don't because every person brings a different experience to what they're seeing. And it gives you a chance to kind of open your eyes up to new experiences and exchanges with that. So I'm a big component of um, discussing the narrative. Uh, I'm very fortunate because right now yeah. I do get to talk to the yeah. artist, <laughs> Bianca L. Period McGraw, with me here on Buffalo What's Next. Um, so can we talk maybe about mm-hmm. some of the things that you, like you said, those, the reactions yeah. that you've had, the dialogue that you've gotten into? Yeah. What are people saying? Who are some of these people that, that you've uh, encountered with uh, during okay. from, from your art, especially here in Buffalo in, in maybe recent times? So I think when I started, um, I did a painting with uh, using 10,000, who's a spoken word poet for Buffalo, uh, also an artist. Um, and his piece kind of involves uh, police uh, shootings because um, it has different elements of guns um, and how it looks. And so some people would talk about it. It was like, oh, this is really cool. And then they really look and they're like, oh, my goodness. And so they get to talk about their experiences. So a lot of those kind of took place at different restaurants I was at. Um, and sometimes people share stories of like their just personal like feelings about it or incidents that they may have had. Um, recently, I just did one of Jillian uh, Hainsworth, our poet laureate for Buffalo. Uh, I used her. Uh, well, I talked to her first okay. <laughs> to ask her, "Can I paint her?" And she said yes. Um, and I wanted to display kind of what tops was the tops situation without using tops. And I did use the shopping carts, but I didn't want to use the branding Um, because to me, this was more than just the location. You know, it's it's the community that was impacted. You know, there's this food desert that exists. There is this memorance. There are these issues. And now when I'm painting this and when people finally notice the shopping carts in the in the hair, we we get a conversation about like it is a food desert and what happens next. And some people are telling me that the things that they're doing within the community. And so this is happening at coffee shops that I'm at, at bars, drinking. It's really weird. <laughs> but people <laughs> have opinions and they have feedback. And it's it's just it's great listening um, because it may not spark too much change, but I feel like it does because then also I'm learning about action, community action that I didn't know was happening, um, that I can go and be a part of or support. And so a lot of that is happening. Uh, I'm right in my mm-hmm. hands right at this moment. I have your coffee painting of, of Jillian Hainsworth. And now, as you mentioned, I mm-hmm. do see the, the shopping carts there as well. Uh, uh, Jillian very quickly becoming my favorite Buffalonian, I might say. Um, but <laughs> she you, is me. Yeah, she, she really is an amazing person. But it is amazing to see the types of mm-hmm. artistic response that, have, that has come out of, uh, of this, to call it a tragedy is really an understatement. But but back to what you said, these conversations. Mm. Well, are there? Do people say I'm learning things? Are that I, I'm learning something through what you're doing here. That I've learned something about this Buffalo community that I didn't know before. Mm-hmm. I think. I think it's difficult. I think for me, I'm learning more about Buffalo because I'm not originally from Buffalo, um, and so my conversations with people, it's me learning about them per se, um, and feels like it's a little bit more healing for me in that exchange. Um, I think for others, sometimes it's about, it depends on the exchange. So, you know, um, like, what does that mean? Like, it's just more opinion based. Um, I think, but also providing space for someone to talk. Because not everyone's comfortable with having these discussions. And when are you going to talk about it when you don't have people that you can have that exchange with? You know, so I am creating space for that, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. That makes a lot of sense. Because yeah. you're right. It's it's one of those things. These are very difficult issues mm-hmm. to talk about, yeah. especially in a community. And we know we talk about it quite a bit on the show 
about the segregation yes. that is here in Buffalo. And hopefully we're starting to see some conversations that are occurring yeah. beyond that segregation. Artist Bianca McGraw with Jay Moran. Now, a cool men's I do from Evergreen Health with WBFO's Bridget Jaipal Valenza. There are often conversations about representation Mm -hmm. and what representation means to people of color, Mm -hmm. to non-white people simply and solely. Um, How important is that? How important Mm -hmm. is representation? I think representation is very important, right? Um, We we talk about some of these organizations that are doing this type of work um, or doing any type of work, right, from an industry perspective. But if you're in spaces, right, so I'm coming from a healthcare background, Mm -hmm. um, and so we serve people uh, in in a healthcare need, right? And so if you're looking at that person and you don't have any frame of reference for what life they might live outside of your walls, you know, like the doctor's office or primary care, right. you're missing a really big component of how that person is coming in and how you might serve that person. And so a lot of organizations, I know, you know, we've talked about nonprofits that are doing work that are, you know, helping areas on Jefferson Avenue. If you don't have that frame of reference for how that person, their lived experience, you're doing a great disservice to those folks, right? And so I think from a representation standpoint, in the DEI world, we talk often about best practices and mirroring the representation of your employees to where you, um, you know, you serve in that community, and that's a best practice. And it's because you're getting those different perspectives of folks that are coming from that lived experience. And so, without it, how are you informing the work that you're doing? You know, is that coming from your own internal interests, or is it coming from the community that exists? Um, and existed there probably before you got there in that community, right? Right. So it's really important to take that frame of reference uh, from a direct lived experience for sure. So, you know, one of the the questions that I I had really Mm -hmm. was um, some people can say that imagination versus representation Mm. is what's needed in order to see yourself Mm -hmm. Or to um, to have empathy for another person, that takes more imagination than it does representation. Mm-hmm. How how would you respond to that? I would. Well, empathy is something that I feel like innately we should have. Right? We mm-hmm. should innately be concerned about other people, even if they don't look like you. So, I would say that. Empathy is definitely something in this country we've been talking a lot about, right? How do you encourage people to have more empathy for people that might not look like them? Um, But in terms of the representation component, it is oftentimes where people do have to imagine what that might look like because someone hasn't done it before. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of firsts that we're still celebrating. Um, And sometimes people ask, well, why is this such a big deal that we're celebrating, you know, this first? The first... African American woman on the Supreme Court. Exactly, exactly. Um, but representation in that sense really matters because you know a young black woman looking at um, you know Justice Katanji, that's amazing, right? To see yeah. that someone has done it before and that you have a path of doing the same thing. Um, and so it's representation. It's it's some imagination and just seeing that hey, I can do this. Mm-hmm. Someone else has done it before, and even if someone hasn't done it before saying this isn't the I have the will to be the first um, is really important for for folks and part of that too is is exposure mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. education and really having that a, a drive that innate drive right um, but that really does come out of your education yeah it does come out of the spaces where you're from right. Right. Um, And it really truly is difficult to have imagination if you're concerned that you don't have lunch today. Yeah, absolutely. Right. We always talk about what is it? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. Um, And from a healthcare perspective, too, we think about it from the social determinants of health perspective. Right. So we know that accessing health care or accessing a doctor is only about 20 percent of someone's total care. Mm -hmm. Things like transportation, education, economics, um, safety 
and security within your own communities. Those are all important facets, access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and so it's only one component of a larger social and economic need that we need to be talking about for sure. Yeah. Um, let's go back to what corporations can do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, talk to me about corporate culture. Yeah. And the importance of that, especially right now. Yeah. For people. Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, right now, millennials, the millennial, uh, millennial generation is one of the largest in the workplace right now. There's about four to five different generations at any given point in time. But a lot of the conversations that we're having as it relates to culture is is the need for that to be the focus. Um, oftentimes people are like, oh, millennials and, and Generation Z, which is now entering the workplace as well want the flexibility. They want the ability to work from anywhere, especially after the pandemic. Certainly. But what we've seen after looking at different surveying is the fact that culture is still number one for a lot of people. They want to belong to an organization that cares about them. The behaviors reflect the mission and values um, that, that that organization stands on. And they want to make sure that they can thrive within that organization and, and bring more of their full selves to work. So culture is still number one in terms of what folks are looking at as it relates to making the decision of where they want to, you know, work. And certainly I think that, you know, people have choice. I mean, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. great resignation yeah. uh, has people changing jobs for maybe as, you know, not necessarily for more money. Right, right. But for a better work culture, a better environment where they can thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking earlier a little bit about um, racism mm -hmm. and the difference between a company having anti-racists mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or just someone who is not a racist. Yeah. And, and there's a, a difference. There is. There is a difference. And I think, you know, in talking about it, one is more passive, um, but one is just pr more proactive, right? And so to be anti-racist, you have to be proactively combating some of those norms and status quo that existed um, prior to you having a focus on this, right? Right. And so to be proactive, that means that you're often anticipating some of the needs of, of the people that you're serving, of your own employees as well. What are the differences in terms of how people are showing up, right? I mm -hmm. think um, even from a gender perspective, these are conversations that we're having is, you know, the curb cut effect is something that we often talk about as DEI practitioners. And it came out of the, um, you know, the ADA compliance realm where people talked about the curb cuts within sidewalks. Um, and although people that were differently abled, it, it helped and benefited them. It benefited a lot of other folks as well. If you're pushing a stroller, that curb cut is, is helpful for it's you. It's very right? helpful. Yes. Um, I love to travel my suitcase, pulling my suitcase. I can use that people that are maybe, um, you know, taking things off a truck and rolling it into a store or whatever you have, um, it's useful for them too. So when you always solve for the people who, you know, have, have the most issues, mm -hmm. it's going to help everybody. And I think from a racial perspective, we've seen that as well. Folks who are disenfranchised the most, um, if you're solving for their needs, everyone else is going to benefit as well. So I think that's the larger connection point. We all definitely have, biases mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that informs how we move through the world right. how we move through spaces talk to me about unconscious bias yeah so you know if you have a brain you have bias right mm -hmm. um we're all born into it and it's honestly how the brain works there's different like the frontal and um, temporal lobes in your brain produce stereotypes. And so we actively have to, um, you know, concern ourselves with how do we kind of work around those biases and how do we better inform ourselves um, to react and to act differently. And so I think first and foremost, just understanding that you have bias is the first step. Um, secondly, it's it's doing a little bit more exploration and digging into what those biases might be. Um, Harvard has a great way of actually testing that with the Harvard Implicit Association test, mm -hmm. where you can test things like gender bias or racial bias, um, et cetera. But 
the awareness is, is first and foremost, and then actively working against what those biases look like. A lot of conversations that I have with people, too, are are questioning and auditing the own things, the, the very things that you take in. So your media, what media are you are you consuming? And does it showcase different people in a different way, right? That would maybe reinforce those biases that you might already have pre-existing. What books are you reading? Mm-hmm. Um, what what are you consuming? And and are there differences in what that might look like? And and then actively going and looking for things that might not be in agreement with what you already might believe is, is is a way to also you know attack some of those biases as well. So right now we are three months out from the five fourteen massacre. Mm-hmm. Um, you do a lot of work in inclusion, diversity, equity. Yeah, yeah. Before May fourteenth and to now, mm-hmm. what changes have you noticed? Yeah, I can say um, you know twenty twenty was really a time that we had a lot of conversations around the DEI space. Um, We had George Floyd's murder Mm -hmm. that really sparked a lot of conversations and organizations um, looking to move beyond some of the traditional learning and education that they were doing to now looking at ways to operationalize DEI within their organizations. Um, I think for us here in Buffalo, it's been a litmus test since 514. There's a lot of things that we have learned and are continuing to learn. Um, But it really just gave us an opportunity to kind of level set and see where we needed to be going as a community um, and as a business community altogether as well. So what does DEI mean to you Mm -hmm. exactly? Well, I would say as a practitioner in this space, um, it's really getting to the point where you're creating environments that are very inclusive, right? Um, And by inclusive, I mean, no matter how you're coming into an organization, um, you're going to feel a sense of belonging. You're going to feel a sense that you can come as your full self um, and just really thrive in, in that organizational culture. So for me as a practitioner, it's creating spaces that no matter how you're showing up, you're going to succeed and thrive. Um, when we talk about diversity, I always say it's a fact, right? You can name different aspects of diversity, but um, inclusion is a choice. Mm-hmm. And Organizations can decide whether they're going to have inclusive cultures or exclusive cultures, um, but people are paying attention. These are conversations that even during interview processes, they're asking us these questions um, as people that are job seekers, right? Right. And so just creating environments that no matter what, you're, you're going to succeed. So there are people out there who you know, work in places and spaces mm-hmm. that don't have DEI mm-hmm. officers. Mm-hmm. They don't have dedicated personnel mm-hmm. to DEI. Um, what can they do to foster yeah. diversity, equity, inclusion um, in in their organization? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of organizations that don't necessarily have dedicated resources um, <clears throat> to DEI, but... Everybody can start somewhere, right? And mm-hmm. I think a really great place to start is auditing what your current practices are, right? Um, looking at it through a lens of equity to make sure that whatever policies and procedures you have in place are not negatively impacting people um, in an unintended way, right? Like there's a lot of things that folks think, oh, this is great that we have these different resources. Um, There was an organization I was working with recently who would give everyone like a gym membership pass as a part of their health uh, components, which which seems like an awesome perk, right? Like working at this business. But then when you looked at where those gyms were located, they weren't in places that everyone could access easily, right? They were located in specific communities that not everyone, you know, had access had access to, right? So I think even from that lens, surveying um, your your folks and seeing what type of organizational climate you have is really important. Um, looking at your engagement scores, you know, a lot of folks do their engagement surveys with their employees, but what does that look like? If mm-hmm. you disaggregated the demographics, how do women feel? You know, um, how do right. people of color feel? How do people who maybe have different abilities feel in your organization? And that will give you a starting point for maybe where to look at. So you are, you know, just... One person. Yeah. I'm one person in an organization. Um, I may not be a black person or a brown person, Mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at the boardroom table. Mm -hmm. I look around 
and I don't see any black or brown mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. there. How do I, as that employee, yeah, say to to my upper management, um, say to the hiring people or the CEO or whoever yeah. it might be who's in charge to say, listen, why aren't there? Yeah, I mean. First off, it, it would certainly take a lot of courage to do that. Sure. But, but people worry about their jobs. Sure. It, you know, being labeled a certain way or not being labeled a certain right, way. Right. Um, you know, and, and the, the politics of that. So how how do you navigate that? How would you navigate that? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it does take a lot of courage, right, to ask questions um, that normally aren't asked. But, you know, as we're shifting into this day and age, these are questions that we can't afford to not ask, right? Right. Um, And so I think exploration is a big part of that, going to your leadership and asking, hey, what is our our plan around diversity, equity, inclusion? Is this something that our organization takes seriously? and, and getting those answers directly from those folks, maybe there are things that that organization's already working on, um, or maybe they don't know where to start. But I would say just those exploration questions in general will get people starting to, to talk about it and think about it. Um, a lot of folks have also started things like employee resource groups that, um, you know, there, there are organizations that have these resource groups that talk about different identities and things that, you know, Mm -hmm. folks are having conversations about, whether that be, you know, from a gender perspective, from ethnicity and race perspective, um, but creating kind of these subgroups that can start to have some of those conversations and start to push the needle forward as well. So maybe that's a way that that organization can start and that employee can start to shift those conversations internally. That's a cool men's I do from Evergreen Health with WBFO's Bridget Jaipal Valenza. This is Producer Picks, highlights of recent interviews from WBFO's Buffalo What's Next program, heard each weekday at 10 a.m., looking at the issues that sprang from the top shooting on Buffalo's east side. Earlier this past week, the 514 Survivors Fund started taking applications for aid from anyone who was on the scene of the shooting. Buffalo NAACP President Mark Blue talks about that with WBFO's Dave Debo. Any and all individuals who feel they have been uh, a part of the uh, massacre that has taken place uh, at TOPS can fill out an application. That application is uh, accessible through the nationalcompassionfund.org. That is the website. And you can scroll down to 514 Survivors Fund, and the application will be online at that time. I also want to share with you that the Buffalo Urban League will be uh, assisting people. They will have navigators there to help individuals uh, fill out the application. And to uh, if there's documents that are required, uh, I would recommend you go to the site, look at the application, and they can tell you if you need any additional documentation. Uh, they will also help you in filling out the application. For, the, for those documents that have to be submitted, uh, some of them will have to be notarized. And uh, the Buffalo Urban League and, and others, some of them have notaries right there. Mm. And you don't have to send the actual document. So it's very critical uh, that those who feel they are grieved, those who feel that they are the survivors as well, uh, and as per the protocol, fill it out because it has to be verified. And the application process ends on September the 14th. Who applies? Who is eligible? Because there has been a lot of discussion in the community about Certainly those who lost family members. Obviously, they're in a a category perhaps different from everyone else. But there has also been discussion about people who were in the TOPS or TOPS workers who uh, have some lingering trauma or who saw things that uh, have have meant expenses for them. Uh, There are workers who lost work because of it. Is this a really big tent? Are they eligible too? Because a lot of the discussion I've heard in the community is that these people are kind of left out. Tell me more. Well, uh, we have made sure, and we try to do our due diligence now, uh, to make sure that individuals who were who lost a family member, uh, individuals who were wounded uh, from the shooting, uh, individuals who were in the store uh, during in which the shooting occurred, um, TOPS employees are part of it as well. 
those who were there and even those who were not because there's still trauma. Those who were, the area of, of, of consideration is in the parking lot area and right around the, the building of that tops. Uh, those are individuals uh, who are eligible to apply. What is available? Let's say someone did not lose a loved one or was not specifically physically injured. What kind of compensation are they eligible for? How, well, how big of a pot of money is it and how large are the individual grants? Well, it, it's not a grant. It's a gift. Okay. I, I want to say that. And, and there's a difference? There's a gift. There's okay. a difference. There's a difference. It, it's, it's a gift that will be given to the individual um, and it's not taxable. Uh, and that's one of the things that we uh, are looking at, making sure that uh, no one, no one should receive any harm from receiving this gift. Uh, and I say that because you have those who are receiving uh, public assistance, those who are receiving some uh, grants and some Medicaid, Medicare, uh, social services. They should not be penalized if they are eligible to receive this gift. Uh, and that is one of the things that we wanted to make sure that um, all because I lost a loved one and I received this, well, that means I am no longer eligible for uh, the assistance that I'm receiving. No, that it means you're not. You, that means that yes, you are still eligible for the resist, assistance that you may be receiving. That's why we're taking great lifts to talk and work with individuals who are in that particular category. And I would say, if you are, and if you apply, and if you are accepted, uh, we'll talk to you, and we have individuals that will help you through that process. So it's very important. What kind of funds could they get and what do that they is still spend to be it determined. on? That is still to be determined. Once you, When you receive a gift, that's yours. We don't tell you what to do with that gift. That is totally uh, your discretion what you do uh, with that particular gift. Uh, but as far as how the funds will be broken down, that is still to be determined because you don't know how many people fit in each category. Uh, we know that those who lost family members are eligible. Those who are wounded and the severity of their wounds and the, even the follow-on care are eligible. Those who are in TOPS during that time are eligible. TOPS employees, that can be verified uh, by, their, uh, by TOPS itself hmm. and also by the police. Those are things that we look at. How large is the overall fund right now? Currently, uh, if you can go on the website, it would say 4.6 Four four point six million, but we do believe it may be more than that because there are organizations that are, for instance, the Buffalo Bills selling T-shirts. Mm -hmm. um, Tim Hortons is selling a special donut, so it, it's going to take some time for all of that to come into play uh, as far as receiving the benefits from those uh, special uh, special gifts and special shirts that they have. But the fund will be closed. Uh, and receiving no more monies, September the 20th, uh, the fund will be closed. And that's a matter of accounting purposes so we can know exactly how much we have and how much we can allocate. That's when the, the committee will come back together, look at the overall applicants and look at the overall total of the fund and then make the distributions uh, categories, well, the distribution amounts uh, to those particular categories. And the distribution is not necessarily just a mathematical process. If you have a thousand dollars and ten people, then you do the math and you can figure out how, you, how much each person gets. That's not what you're doing here, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. What sort of calculus do you undertake to figure out who gets what? If this one family member, uh, an allocation would be made toward that family member, and then the other members would receive whatever is on that category. Okay. So we we want to make sure that we're fair with everyone. If someone and their their son or daughter were both in the tops, it would go to the parent, perhaps. Yes. Okay. It, there is a, a process to where the guardian uh, can apply for those two for, for those for that, for that particular scenario, and it, and there's a process to which we want to make sure that it goes to the right people. How do you figure out who gets how much? That's a process. Once we get all of the information, once the fund is closed, once we know how much money we're dealing with. Uh, then we will look at assigning monies to those categories. In the application, do people, and I, I heard what you said earlier about when you get a gift, uh, you, you don't necessarily have strings on it. In the application process, 
What do you ask them? Do they say how they want to spend it? That, get, that is not even a part of the application. How they're going to spend it is not a part of the application okay. process at all. Uh, once you have been uh, certified or uh, accepted, and once everything has been validated, it's a gift. It's yours. We do not tell you how to spend the gift uh, that you have been given. That's totally upon the individual. Now, there's also a process to where, um, depending on, well, there's a process to if you would like to have some information on um, investing or things like that, we, that would be available to you as well. So people will be, I, I hate to use the word divided up, but people will be categorized. You'll have a category of people, I imagine, who lost loved ones. You'll have a category of people who were physically injured. Correct. And then tell me a little bit about what the other categories are starting to look like to the well, degree that you have. You have the categories of uh, TOPS employees. You have the category of survivors who were in the store, in the parking lot area. And then you also have non me employees and tops who were not at the store. So you have actually, and this is new to even the Survivors Fund, we added that category to make sure we covered everyone who would be affected. If, if a shut-in, for example, has spent extra funds to do Instacart or some sort of online shopping, that is a cost to them as a result of the shooting. Is that something that would make them an applicant? No, no. You have to be in the store. You have to be present in the store. Okay. Uh, so it, it's not for someone who was an online shopper, uh, but you have to be present in the store. Some of the community has needs that will not be met by this fund. That's just a that's that's a, a byproduct of the way it's set up. Yes. Okay. Yes. What do you do for them? We have nothing, no provisions uh, for some for for the for those particular individuals. Let, let me rephrase the question. What does the community? Because I, I understand the fund well, being different. We, what does the community at, do for when them? When we look at what's happening in our community right now. There are a lot of different services that are being provided for the community, uh, even uh, counseling services that are being provided for the community. And uh, from what the county was saying, that, that that's still going to be an ongoing process uh, to help the community heal. Uh, there are a lot of different agencies that are coming in the community to help them heal as well. There are uh, healing circles from different organizations that are there to help them heal. This is a continued process. Uh, once the fund is over, the fund is over there is a another uh, organizational fund called Help Buffalo Heal, and that's being uh, used to look at what we can do to make that area better. So there's a lot of different agencies and helps that are still being provided to the community, and not just now, but tomorrow and for years to come. You're going to see these agencies continuing to to provide to help and support uh, to make Buffalo better to curb. Uh, what the white supremacist thought he could do uh, in making, in disrupting and, and dividing Buffalo. Uh, he may have disrupted us, but he did not divide us. What he did was to make us stronger and we're stronger together. How do people get in touch? Applications start opening today. Yes. Where do they go? What do they do? How do they access not only the application, but some of the other services you spoke of, the uh, the, the guides that will take them through the process? Well, we, I do know that uh, Buffalo Urban League, they're located on, the Jeff in, on Jefferson. They will be uh, a spot or a resource in which they can have navigators, and they will be ready to help individuals uh, go through the process. Uh, the Resource Center on East Ferry is also a site that is being used. I just read in the news that the uh, Macedonia Baptist Church is supposed to be a site as well. But I do know that the Resource Center on Jefferson, on the East Ferry uh, will be a site to have navigators. Uh, those navigators will be possibly eligible to go to homes of those who are still affected, who haven't left their home, or who are still dealing with the trauma uh, of the 514 massacre. All right, here's that paper and pencil part if people wanted to write down some resources. The Buffalo Urban League is at buffalourbanleague.org. And their phone number is 250-2400. Again, that's 250-2400. The actual application is online somewhere. Where do people go to access that? The people can ask, access the application on nationalcompassionfund.org and scroll down to Buffalo Survivors Fund, 514 Survivors Fund, and you can get the application online, online as well. 
Uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was make the process very easy to where you can even apply on your phone uh, because we do know that everyone, that the majority of people have a cell phone, so you can start the process even on your cell mm. phone. Great. Reverend Blue, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Reverend Mark Blue is the president of the NAACP Buffalo Chapter and also chair of that 514 Survivors Fund. Co-chair. Co-chair. Okay. <laughs> we, we don't want to get the, uh, the people that you're chairing it with upset. He is the co-chair of the 514 Survivors Fund. He spoke with WBFO's Dave Debo. Before we wind up the program, Jay Moran returns now with, of all people, the head basketball coach at SUNY Buffalo State. We're talking with Imam Fadri Ansari of uh, the uh, Masjid Numan on Fillmore Avenue, and of course, longtime basketball coach here in Western New York as well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jay, for having us. Um, most certainly pleased, and uh, I'll try not to let this uh, conversation devolve into all about basketball because I'm curious about uh, uh, tapping into your knowledge and experience, but um, let's talk about the community uh, to start things off. You've been at uh, Masjid Numan now for over 30 years, um, so you have a great understanding of that neighborhood for sure. Tell me what life is like right now along and for the people that, that attend. Well, um, we know for Buffalo overall, we've had a very um, uh, trying year. Um, uh, for 2000 or 2022. And um, I am happy that uh, despite the challenges we've gone through, um, that we have kind of bonded together. I feel the community has come uh, closer together in support, which in some cases, especially when you have a, a tragic um, shooting and killing that's um, race-related, um, it can have a lot of offspring to a lot of violence and riots and ongoing hatred. Um, um, so thankfully, uh, Western New York, that didn't take place. And I think it's kind of true to the city o over the years. I, I remember in, um, after the uh, 2011, the bombing um, at the World Trade, and we had a rally out in um in front of the city hall at the Lafayette, at, at the circle, right. and we were um, able to share some words. And unlike a lot of other places around the country, uh, we didn't have a lot of the uh, aftermath um, that understandably took place, uh, the hatred and the anger, you know, towards uh, the Muslim community. Um, so that didn't happen as much, you know, here. And so I'm, I'm happy in this particular incident with, with the tops um, uh, shooting that is, in overall, I think is bringing people uh, together. I mean, it certainly brought highlight to some elephant in the room issues that still need yes. to be resolved in, here in, in, in Western New York as well in this country. But um, I think overall, I, I felt a sense of people, humanity overcoming that here. That's, that's good to hear. And we have heard that as well. And I'm, I'm curious, have people turned to their faith during this time? I mean, has that been... Have you seen that from uh, the, the people, the, the members of your community? Yes, and I think that's a, a, a true testimony of, a, of of the believer. You know, we have you know, verses in our book in the Quran, you know, just uh, lose not heart nor fall into despair, for you certainly will uh, achieve um, success. You achieve um, victory, you know, if you if you are true in, in, in faith. And... Um, so I think that's important for the, the believer to understand that nothing is outside of um, uh, God's awareness, um, that we're all going to be tried and, and, and tested. This is a part of our being the highest form of God's creation, which is the human family. And so it's, it's a challenge. Um, when you look at all faith, it tells us about the forces of good and, and evil, and uh, it's a challenge to to really believe and to promote that good goodness is on the rise and and it's, um, there's more good people than there are bad. It's just sometimes the bad people have control of the microphone. Right. Mm -hmm. and I'm interested to uh, to also talk about um, Masjid Numan uh, in the sense of how that 
community has changed, right? Uh, you know, they, we hear the stories and stories about influx of immigrants coming to uh, Buffalo, and most certainly you have seen that uh, for you, for your. Uh, yeah, our uh, our community uh, goes back for many many decades. It was historically rooted in the uh, the former former nation of Islam, um, with the time under Honorable Elijah and Clara and Muhammad, and it was a way to try to subtly introduce the principle of Islam, but more overtly directing the the uh, racism and um, the nationalism aspect that was um, empowering, making you feel like you were somebody important and recognizing that your root in history was something that was, was great. Um, so over the years, like most um, cities around the, the country, um, whether you label gentrification or just a natural process of, of people moving and immigrating into the community. So we've had um, an influx in the city of uh, Buffalo. Many populations, there's been an uh, increase in Muslim growing all over. Um, there's uh, Somalians, and then you have um, uh, people from Burma uh, coming in, and then the more, I mean, they, I don't want to just try to name all, because I wouldn't be able to name all of them. Sure. But um, more recently, um, uh, the Bangladesh community has really um, grown, increased on the um, the east side of a uh, uh, of Buffalo, and they uh, actually now in in our services on Friday they probably make up about half the population for Friday service. You know, not so much in the regular attendance or activities that we involve in, but for services and. Um, it used to be decades ago you probably knew every mosque that was in Buffalo at least, but it's. I, c I couldn't even begin to try to say because there's so many popping up, you know, at different uh, parts of the city around. If I'm not mistaken, yours, and this is according to something I read in the Buffalo News an article from a few years ago, so the numbers probably aren't quite right, but I think yours was the second in the mm -hmm. city, and now there's over 20. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, and I don't know, I know there was a, a, a you know, there's a, a Parker Street masjid over by the University of Buffalo has been there for, for years, but if we go back to the actual Nation Islam Temple days that we're going back to the fifties, you oh, know, okay. the fifty four and then Lackawanna probably um the the community there when they came over to work in the factories, you know, you're going back to those decades. And then there was a uh a community out in West Valley, you know, that's going back um back, you know, to that area too around the fifties or so. Um but it's it's now, you know, most of the the mosques um in the city, I think, of mostly from immigrant communities. Hey, you know, what about the Muslim community? And I, I'm asking for generalities of, of sorts here, but there are so many misconceptions. You talked about uh, some of the issues that were seen after the, you know, the 2001 um, World Trade Center attack mm -hmm. um, that we're That's seeing. 2000, I meant 9-11. Yeah, 9-11. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but... Um, what about that? I mean, that, I still think there are lots of misperceptions. At least that's how I see it. But what, what do you find? What What are the things that maybe when you're talking to people who aren't really familiar with the faith that are misconceptions? One of the first misconceptions of mine is usually is trying to differentiate culture from the true tenets of the religion. Um, most people will probably think that um, most Muslims are Arabs or they come from Arabs, but... Arabs probably make up only a third of the uh, Muslim population in the world. Um, the Asian community is the largest um, of people of, uh, who are Muslims in the world. And then Africa has a very, very large pocket. Then, you know, so you have Asian, you have India, um, so African. So they're far outnumbered than the Arabs just because the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language and started in Mecca. Most people associate it, but when we, you make the pilgrimage uh, to Hajj, you, you would see uh, different. We made a few years ago. And um, wait, you know, wait, What was that like, if you don't mind sharing? It's, it's very hard to describe, but it's, it's, it's not a vacation, that's for sure. People right. think it's, it's one of the five pillars of faith. You know, we have belief in one God. You make you offer your prayer, your worship. You know, you, you um, give in charity and you fast during the month of Ramadan. And then the fifth pillar is that uh, once in a lifetime, if you can afford to do so, you make the pilgrimage um, uh, to Mecca. And you truly see all of the whole planet in, in its representation. You see 
people that look like people you know from back home, and then you just see different um, variations of, like I've seen, feature-wise, you would think that they were Asian or Chinese, but they would be darker than me, you know, real dark. So you see, then you see very tall um, Slavic or European people, so, you know, it's, you're seeing a true universal picture of humanity when you make the uh, the pilgrimage. So when I first entered inside of um, where the the Kaaba is or the the harem, the, the mosque, I guess it's best to describe walking to a huge stadium, you know, with three layers, and, and then there's people on the grounds walking, and it's, it's almost like a way, it's almost kind of like a motion picture type experience on the on the ground level and um so you just have to just pause you know um but everyone is there for the same uh, purpose and um if not you wouldn't have millions of people who would without having chaos you know without be, having some type of order it's interesting because like you said it was it's it's not a vacation but the gleam in your eye in describing mm-hmm. what you saw and the different types of people that you saw there uh, it really obviously something that really moved you yeah it's um it's like being um like i said it's like being reborn you know um you, you know you can say these things but you have to really be sincere and, and true like like a fasting the one month of ramadan is said if you fast for the period of 29 or 30 days those who are able to health wise to do so that you're cleansed and like all of your sins of the year is forgiven well, it's also saying when you make the pilgrimage, it's almost like your all of your previous sins or atonement is for your whole life is 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 renewed, you know, at, at that time. And so, um, I, I would like to go again. I'm planning to go because um, um, the first time you you just you know your eyes are just so big, but but now you're understanding the the different locations and there's certain rituals, but the true meaning of it. And and most people, the other thing I would say, to, uh, maybe to the audience, they're not really aware of this. It's not really about Muhammad the uh, the Hajj. It's really about the, the life story of, of Prophet Abraham and his son Ismail being sacrificed, and um, and the mother Hagar. We know the story was an outcast, and her looking for a refuge for a son and finding a, a, a place and the water, which we, the water of, we call water of Zam Zam, that's part of the ritual we run from the two mountains where she was looking to help. So um, it's really on um, the Father Abraham, all the, the main religion, uh, the three major religions of faith, Christianity and Judaism and, and Islam, is really um, the universality is, uh, is part of this uh, process. So. We follow in the example of Prophet Muhammad in, in making the pilgrimage, but it really goes back to the first house of worship that was established by Prophet Abraham. Imam Fajri Ansari with Jay Moran. And we close today with words from social worker Veronica Golden on how the hits just keep on coming, especially for our youth. For right now, uh, what our children need, especially in that area, is, is structured to help bring a sense of safety uh, because, I mean, just beyond what happened on May 14th, uh, the last couple of years, it's been like crazy in America. Right. <laughs> so right. like with COVID and the last president and, you know, the George Floyd incident. I mean, we were just like, it was crazy. Here. It's kind of like moving from one trauma to the next. Yes. Yes. And in a seeming never-ending cycle. Right. And so that's why it definitely affected me. It impacted me, the incident that happened at Tops. But I feel like it didn't impact me as much as it perhaps could have just because of the vicarious trauma that, you know, we constantly take in, Mm -hmm. um, you know, on on social media all the time. Talking about, you know, somebody was shot and, you know, this was a grocery store, but it's been at a church and, you know, while somebody was walking and taking a jog in somebody's apartment. So it's one thing after other after other. Buffalo What's Next is a podcast online on demand and heard each weekday morning at 10 and evenings at 9 on WBFO. Daily discussions about race, education, segregation, and our shared humanity. I'm Angelie Preston. Thanks for joining us.